Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, just want to check that everybody can hear me. Is everything good? Yep, fabulous. Okay, um, welcome to uh, the GBNI Next Level launch. Um, thanks for joining us today um, at our lunch, for our, one of our lunchtime lectures. Um, we're really excited about this year's cohort and we're really excited to kind of share some of the work with you and share some of our uh, relationships we've been building with industry partners. Um, so this is the first of a few events that we're running for the degree show this year. Um, so this one is looking at specifically our relationship with Brand Opus and React, and it will also um, be looking at, um, we'll also have a keynote speaker, Jack Renwick, later on. Um, so I'm Emily, I'm the year three lead for graphic branding and identity at LCC. Um, and I've been here for about three years and I've been working quite closely with the third years each year on their grad show. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you the student work from this year. I'm just gonna hand over to our course leader, Sunita, um, for, a, for a quick um, bit of information and then I'll come back to you today. Thanks. So, um, hello everyone. So I'm um, Sunita Yeomans. Um, I'm the um, course leader for graphic branding and identity. Um, and this, um, and I've just been here for one, one academic year now, not even a whole normal year, just one academic year. Um, so this is my first year of um, third year graduates. Um, so um, I want, basically, I just want to say a few thank yous to, to the people that have kind of helped our students to get to this point and obviously to the students. So students, first of all, students, um, all of you, um, congratulations um, on graduating, on completing your, your, your degree. Um, I think um, I am so impressed with all of you for the for, for just being able to um the creative your creativity and what you've managed to achieve and your products projects and your understanding of of briefs and how to use graphic branding and identity i think it's absolutely incredible what you've each and every one of you has managed to achieve in lockdown most of the time being stuck in stuck in very um quiet lonely lonely rooms on your own so um unbelievable um so amazing work um and i can't wait to see what what you do next the other people i want to thank there's a few people um the staff team because students without the incredible um staff team um you wouldn't know you wouldn't have graduated because you wouldn't have got to to where where you've got to so thank you to the permanent staff which is um katie max emily um and Harriet, who just joined us recently, um, the um, and also all of the associate lecturers. We have fourteen associate lecturers that work across all three years, um, and they are absolutely an in incredible team. So I want to thank thank all of them, um, and really recognise that for the our graduating students actually it's your all those three years or four years if you took a year out um that um to get you here um i also want to thank our industry partners um for setting the the briefs that our third years have worked on for their fi uh, final major projects um and especially a huge thank you for the industry partners who really were so encouraging in the way they supported our students and fed back to our to our students and and encouraged them um, uh, through throughout these last sort of few months. Um, and I want to thank special lecturers um, and alumni, so the the people that come in and just do a kind of a one off very specialist lecture for us. Again, absolutely incredible um, and um, brilliant that you can take part and taking part in this. And then my final one is a thank you to um, future employees. So if you're listening to this, if you're not here today, but you're listening to this, um, uh, we would like to thank you for giving jobs to our wonderful graduates. That's it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great.
Thank you, Sunita. So many, lots of thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank let's get on and have a look at some of the work. So um, first up, we are really excited to be joined today by um, Brand Opus. Oh yeah, sorry, what we're going to be doing as well. So I'll just run through what we're doing. So obviously we've just kind of done the welcome. We're going to be um, talking to Brand Opus and uh, Sophia, one of our students, can be asking some questions and having a bit of dialogue around that brief. Um, and then we'll be moving on to look at um, React, another student brief that um, we've been working on in third year and one of our students just won recently as well. Then we'll have a short comfort break and um, then we'll welcome our keynote speaker at one o'clock. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So let's move on. Um, so um, we're really excited to be joined today by um, Emily Mayers and Hannah Tunley from Brand Opus. Hannah Tunley is an alumni of GBNI, so it's really great to welcome her back into the fold this year for the uh, for the show. Um, and um, so uh, every year, Brand Opus set a brief for our students. Um, and last year, Hannah Tunley won that brief, which was really exciting. And so now is working with Brand Opus. Um, and we just had the news yesterday that um, Sophia um, uh, was a runner up for the brief this year. So we're really excited to kind of carry on this collaboration and um, kind of be working quite closely with them, um, with our kind of students and the work that they're making. So I'm gonna now be quiet and hand over. So I'd like to welcome Emily, Hannah and Sophia, um, and they're gonna have a bit of a conversation about the brief, give you a bit of context and you'll see a bit of the outputs as well. Thanks. Hi, Did you, should we give a bit of an intro? Um, so I'm Emily, I am a senior designer at Brand Opus. I've worked here for about eight years um, and I look after the Chrysalis programme, which is the brief that we set with um, third year universities. Um, like Emily mentioned, we um, managed to develop this great relationship with LCC um, and Hannah here is actually on internship with us, uh, seventh week yeah, of internship? Yeah, so we're on seven now. Yeah, so it's going well. Yeah, for any like first years that haven't met me before, um, I'm Hannah. I graduated last year. Some of you might have seen me around uh, GBNI Studio, but I appreciate that was a long time ago now, thanks to COVID. <laughs> so yeah, um, hopefully there's some familiar faces in the chat. Um, but yeah. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm a graduate of this year and I was one of the students that entered the Brand Opus brief competition. Wonderful. Um, maybe Sophia, you could, I know you've got a few questions that you were going to ask. Um, and as you're kind of having a bit of a dialogue, um, we've got some images that are kind of going to run through, which has um, work from Hannah, so the winner from last year, and then Sophia's work, and then also has some of the other students' um, submissions for the brief. So we can kind of just have that going through in the background. But um, I'm going to hand over to Sophia, maybe you want to ask a few questions. Yeah, um, I was just wondering for Hannah what it's been like as a graduate, because obviously if you want to like first graduates to graduate like a pandemic, what it's been like and kind of your experience from it. What, since graduating or here? Um, since graduating. Oh, since graduating. Um, it's been a bit weird, can't lie, but what I've tried to do is like make some positives out of it. And I think um, I'd say the same to third years graduating now is don't get too disheartened about not being able to find a job or internships. You can make it work for yourself. So. What I did was, while I was applying for jobs and internships, I decided to set myself up as a freelancer and take it like seriously and set myself up as self-employed and try and find branding projects, big, small, whatever, I, I was ready to take it. So I worked on a couple of different things. So all, I think all of it was branding from what I remember. Um, I worked with a female empowerment group um, called Zoli Manzel, who have Mauritian roots, um, creating kind of a brand identity and social media kit for them. And more recently, before I started interning here at Brand Opus, I was freelancing with a brand licensing agency and working on some branding projects with them. Um, again, they were like social purpose brands. 
um, which are going to be taken to some buyers. Um, I can't say too much because it's under <laughs> an NDA, um, but that was really fun. So, and then yeah, I came here middle of March, um, mm. still going at the minute. So, yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to in the last year. Just to build on that as well, I think as a like, potential employer, one thing that definitely impressed us with the panel and your interview um, with our creative directors was that initiative to you know be self be self aware and have that enthusiasm and that self initiative to do those extra projects. Um, so whether it's something freelance or something else, we've seen different students is going back over the. Um, graduate projects and actually like we looking at them developing them further so any kind of drive in the meantime in between internships or in the gap before you are able to get a job has come across really well um, and we've responded really well to those students that you know they're really enthusiastic about the design that they're doing um, it's like a good way to also like make sure you keep up to date with like skills and stuff like that because it's pretty easy to forget all those <laughs> keyboard shortcuts that you spent years learning. Um, yeah, and it's, I think that's the beauty of like being like a creative is you can kind of create a job for yourself. It might not be what you want to do for the rest of your life. Not everyone loves freelancing, um, but it's a good experience nonetheless, especially like at the minute. Um, it's a good opportunity to take if you can't, can't quite get, you know, um, to where you want to be in terms of like internships and jobs like don't be too hard on yourself that's what i've learned like don't beat yourself up it's a hard time at the minute <laughs> thank you that kind of asked my next question if you had any advice for but i guess if you have any other advice for kind of to both of you for recent um, ads coming out this year. i'd say something that's been beneficial to me um might be a little late now i'm not sure but making sure you take part in things like dna d new blood um setting yourself up profiles on the dots setting yourself up on instagram i found a lot of work through instagram um smaller projects through instagram that's been like my main sort of way people have found me um so make yourself like present because if you're hiding your work then no one's going to see it no one's going to know that you're like available to you know work with or whatever there's no point hiding what you've spent three years on so yeah make sure you like get your work out there put it in front of a lot of like noses you know just keep on going with it um and i guess advice from me if i build on that um I think just about making sure your enthusiasm is out there as well as your work and um, that like for us we do have limited spaces for internships at the minute so we really are interested in people that um, are showing enthusiasm for the company that they're applying to so that classic thing of like tailored emails and if you don't hear back straight away like maybe you send a follow up and you know that kind of thing of just making sure you're really on it um, and actually following up on people really helps. Thank you so much. I thought it might be good to just get a bit more context around the brief um, for people that maybe don't know um, what the project's about. Um, obviously, we've got some work kind of going through on the slides, so you're getting the opportunity to see that. But I wonder, Emily, could you just maybe give us a little bit of a um, summary of what the brief's about? And then maybe Hannah and Sophia could just spend kind of a few minutes talking through their approach to the project. Sure, so um, it's, this is a competition that we run in partnership with one of our clients, Molson Coors. Um, Molson Coors are one of those companies, umbrella companies that own household brands that uh, we might know. So we work with them a lot in the US, but in the UK we work with them on brands like um, Carling and Aspel. So they're very much a drinks focused brand. Um, so we work in partnership with them and we think that helps the brief give it this sort of industry perspective um, the um, clients that innovation team at Muslim Calls are involved in helping write the brief. So it's things that they are really looking into in innovation right now, things that they're interested in. Um, the clients from Muslim Calls also help with the judging as well as the brand opus uh, design team representatives. So we have um, creative directors, we have strategy um, people, and then we have Muslim Calls clients as well. And they make up the judging panel. So it's really great to have them involved um, throughout the whole process, giving that industry perspective. Um, but in terms of the actual brief that we set this year, um, 
as you can see on the screen share, it was to create a drinks brand um, with a sustainable story at its heart. Um, and we really asked the students to sort of be uh, distinctive and unique about that sustainability. We were so aware of greenwashing, um, but it's still such an important issue. So we challenged the students to think of how they can get across the sustainability story in a unique way. Um, and we asked them to look at it with a mainstream appeal um, because it's such an important issue. We wanted it to have um, a wide reach. So how can you create a mainstream drinks brand which would have the mass appeal? Um, and as part of that, we asked them to look at, we asked quite a lot from the students. So I think impressive to you guys for being a winner and runner up, but um, we uh, asked for complete brand creation. So that involves like naming. Um, we asked the students to find like a, an insight or gap in the market as to why they think their solution is important. Um, and we also act, ask for sort of different brand deliverables um, and activation, uh, however they feel this brand can come to life. So exists at identity and a packaging level, but we ask for more than that, you know, the whole of the brand world and how this brand might exist. <laughs> Um, and we actually had our presentation day yesterday. Um, so we shortlisted down to 14 students. Um, so these names on the screen are the four, oh, 15 here that we um, shortlist to. We give those um, 15 um, feedback. So we have individual feedback calls with each of the students and then they develop um, and do sort of a Dragon's Den style presentation, <laughs> which happened yesterday, but hopefully it wasn't uh, intimidating, Sophia. I, I think you did really well yesterday, so well done. It was really interesting, because obviously you guys were looking at one screen, and I was like looking at you, so I was like, where are they looking? <laughs> Apart from that. A double screen set up, it's quite, uh, quite a lot of screens to look at, so we definitely were paying attention. <laughs> Um, how many how many students enter to the competition? Um, it varies every year, um, and we sort of the unis that we or colleges um, that we work with depends each year depending on who we sort of have the relationship with. A few universities and colleges um, chose not to run the brief this year just because they wanted a different course structure with more like face to face um, projects. Totally understandable with the current environment. You know, a lot of students are working from home with less less contact um, but this year we ran it with about 12 universities and colleges and we had um, over 100 entries to, so I think even to get down to the last 15 um, is, is really good and I know this sounds like a cliche but we had such a high standard of work this, this year um, despite everything that's been going on so I was really impressed yesterday with this project. Great, that's really great to know. So yeah, well done, so, um, Sophia, for, for becoming runner-up. Um, okay, so maybe you could just give a bit of context to your approach to the brief. Sure, um, so something I really wanted to look at was finding a way that we could use a circular economy approach, because I feel like there's a gap in the market for a way that we reuse what we have over and over again, instead of just creating something new. And through research and et cetera, I found a milkman delivery approach would be quite unique and fun way of doing it. So it would be doorstop delivery for gin and tonic, because if it's for milk, why can't it be for gin and tonic? And another aspect I wanted to include was using waste from the dairy industry in different ways. So expired milk would actually be used to ferment the gin. And that way you don't need to use up any other products. And it's also putting waste to good use. And then the entire distillery and process would be actually powered by cow poo and whey waste as well. So it kind of keeps the theme of using waste for something else. So I kind of took inspiration from the vintage nostalgic milk van feel, but added a bit of a twist to it because that's what the brand is doing anyway. And through that, I kind of just took off with it. I really love doing this project because the personality was really fun to build. And it was such an open brief. There was like endless opportunities to do with it. So this was kind of the direction that I took. So you'd be able to order different crates of different sizes and gin and tonic would be delivered to your door. <laughs> yeah, there would also be a monthly newspaper as well, which would be printed on recycled materials using vegetable ink to kind of create that community around change and everyone would kind of share their input in different ways that we can come together 
and make an actual change, even if it is something like gin. Because I think it's always fun to do. And I love gin and tonic. So it was fun to include that bit too. Uh, one thing that really stood out as well was those um, newspapers that were just on screen a minute ago. So they actually sent us physical copies in their office. So um, they were definitely a plus on the uh, mm -hmm. on the judging day. I think some people have already filled in their crosswords. So that <laughs> went down really well. Thank you. It was really fun creating them as well and seeing it kind of come to life in print. So it's all really fun. I think it's definitely been one of my favourite projects I've ever worked on because I love kind of branding, but then most of the university like briefs that I've been working on, I've always tried to incorporate a sustainability aspect into it. So it was kind of nice pulling all of my knowledge from those and putting it into something like this. And also it was a great experience as well, having the different feedback that I had on like the initial call and just all the feedback from yesterday. It was a really, really good experience. And I couldn't recommend taking this brief <laughs> any more than I can because there's it just takes you on a journey that you just didn't think would happen and it's just really fun but yeah yeah so Sophia as one of our runners that will actually be joining us on internship as well so that is part of the um the prize for the winner and the runners up so uh, we're excited to have you come into the studio <laughs> thanks I'm so excited too be really fun it'll be nice to also meet people that i've been speaking to through a screen it would be really lovely yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic um hannah i wonder if you could just i know we've got a slide of your work um in yeah. this kind of uh show reel. um you could just briefly talk through a uh, bit your approach to how you yeah. kind of, um went about it last year yeah so we had a slightly different brief last year, but for the same kind of deliverables, I guess. So um, last year's brief was creating a drinks brand that went beyond the benefit of refreshment, if my memory serves me correct. Um, so basically my response to that was a brand called Flink, which was the alternative to Dutch Courage. There was a gap in the market between sort of um, the adult soft drink section where you have things like Schler and um, Dawson's and stuff like that but there was nothing that could kind of replace the effects of alcohol and a lot of people rely on alcohol to boost their confidence and you know make them more comfortable in social situations so I came up with Flink and Flink is kind of a funny name because it's literally the Dutch word for courage um, so it's kind of handy as well how it kind of rhymes with drink. It has a nice little like rhyme to it, I guess. Um, and the brand kind of strategy, I guess, was all about like getting you up on the dance floor, having a good time, like getting that flink feeling, which was kind of the tagline and stuff like that. I'm really kind of focusing on copy um, and the identity to bring through that feeling that I created in the strategy through um, a visual identity I guess um, it was super fun to do and kind of let loose with because that was all at the heart of the brand it meant that I could push the boat out with the way that I like chose to advertise and stuff like that so you can see here on screen that I chose to personify the cans in ads so they're like little dancing cans and stuff like that um, yeah it was I think probably my favorite project from uni I'm not just saying that because you always <laughs> said to me um but I think because it was challenging the brief was super well written in how to approach it as well I specifically remember it asking for blue sky thinking which is kind of an obvious with all projects but I'd never really thought about like going above and beyond with an idea before and making it work to potentially be um commercially viable so um, what I did in like my approach is I decided to like tear up the rule book for how I used to do my process basically and I picked up a copy of the Evening Standard magazine, sat down with it, got a packet of post-it notes and just came up with the most bizarre concepts I could think of in response to random things that were in the magazine and then worked my way up from the blue sky bit into right what could actually work what could sit on the shelf and be you know something that 
people would buy and could drink, you know, can't promise like drinks that would like change your life or anything, um, you know, make you like be able to fly or whatever. Um, but this with like the ingredients, researching that a bit, you know, it's a possible thing. The ingredients in it are all natural and they're, um, I guess like re relaxants and like anti-anxiety ingredients which would then calm your nerves but then bring up your confidence um so yeah i think that's covered like all the basis basis of link um yeah it feels like ages ago now that i did it to be honest um, and one c common thread between hannah and sophia's work i think has been and maybe this isn't uh, a thing from your university so i just wanted to pull it out but one thing that we've been continually impressed with is the way that you've both brought your presentations together and almost their step into strategy a little bit i think has been um, really impressive like you've told the complete story um, we really believe in your journey um, and yeah it's been nice to see that visually brought to life so i think for any future applicants that's something that's really worked well <laughs> in the past two years let's keep that coming <laughs> I think for uni they definitely do, um, especially with Emily as well, doing like the storytelling mm. and a format and creating that tone of voice and everything definitely helped. You learn that like really early on on GB and I. I think it's like um, one of the first year modules, I guess, from what I remember it might have changed. But yeah, learning about like literally branding is more than a logo. Oh, um, sure. So yeah, like strategy is super important part of DBI and like anyone that's like listening and it's like in that younger years, make sure, you know, you really like get your head around that because it's so influential to like your projects. You'll find that across all your projects. Yeah, and I think it's really helped you guys stand out against other universities, to be honest. It is crazy to see kind of how, even like the process, because I think the great thing about GBI is you do everything from the start of the brand to the end and it gives you such an insight on it and the way the tutors like help you build up that process because at the beginning everyone was like oh we have to do a sketchbook and then like a process document but then the more you do it you kind of learn from that how valuable that process actually is getting everything in a book and writing down everything it just helps so much and it is so crazy to see how much you change from like first year mm. to now. And it is just lovely, especially if people are looking to do the course, the tutors help yeah. so much to kind of build that confidence in yourself as well. Um, I promise we didn't bribe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just had a question about that, but I think you've kind of answered it like talking about your process. So we just had a question in the Q and A about, um, for Sophia really about, um, you know, is there any kind of research process tips you would give maybe to come some second years who are coming through to third year, you know, so I guess, yeah, what's your kind of research process? I guess you kind of started talking about sketchbooks and working in that way, but is there anything that you've kind of learned in this third year that you'd kind of um, recommend doing for the second years coming through? So I would say sketchbook is definitely so helpful and to just kind of write down everything that you can because there's going to be so many things in your head and sometimes the little word or idea that you write down you might not think it will be good in the end but GT was literally gin and tonic that I just accidentally wrote down and it ended up being the name that I went with so it's kind of just really trusting the process but enjoying that stage because I think with the research stage there is such a temptation to just get to the end but actually enjoying that process and I always try and do research in creating personas that I can connect with or that I know and kind of thinking about your target audience and thinking what would actually connect with them and why what's out there now isn't connecting with them because it helps so much getting someone else's insight and not just looking at it from a design point of view but looking at it from someone else's point of view because from that you can build such a story and you can take your research in a way that you didn't think that you could before from either just doing a questionnaire or sitting down with someone so I would definitely just throw yourself into your sketchbook and just experiment from the get-go because that's where your journey kind of starts completely and with research it doesn't need to be I mean unless I'm researching say for like finding out if you could use expired milk 
which was very hard because <laughs> I wasn't great at science and didn't really understand most of it, but got there in the end. I don't really use Google. I try and use more a hands-on approach or looking back at things that have inspired me in the past and kind of following from that because I feel, especially with like Pinterest and things, there's such a generic approach that can come from things where it's like a minimal sans serif way but kind of drawing away from that you're able to just explore and have fun but definitely love your sketchbook because it helps so so much and yeah fantastic yeah I think that's definitely especially um you know as we've, been, as we've been kind of living through these kind of digital times having that kind of tactility of your sketchbook and I think I remember both of you have very kind of tactile physical sketchbooks that you were working in for this process so I think it's great to kind of have some time off screen and kind of work in that way um, is really beneficial um, wonderful okay thank you so much guys that was um, really um, insightful and great and it's, it's great to kind of look at the comparisons between your projects and how you both approach things and like how you know it's very strategy heavy research heavy to get to the points that you got to I think that's what's the kind of really amazing thing about both of your projects. Um, so the, we've just got a few images on the screen of um, other kind of amazing approaches from our students this year as well. Um, so yeah, it was a very popular brief with our students. So um, hopefully we can kind of continue that relationship and, and run it next year as well. Um, fantastic. So now we're going to um, move on. Um, and again, you know, just another chance to kind of brag about how fantastic our students are this year um, and last year. Um, so another brief that we run on GBNI is um, is with React, and we run it with Andy Hardwick. Um, and um, this is an opportunity for students to develop a project around road safety. Um, and um, amazingly, last year, um, one of our students, Rihanna, won the brief. Um, and then also this year, we have had a winner from Agatha, um, and we also have a runner up from Chiara. So again, we're really proud of our students this year because um, they've been um, working extremely hard and we understand that it's been um, a difficult year for everyone. Um, and to kind of um, be awarded so many fantastic um, kind of prizes and, and working with such great industry partners over this year has been really, really um, wonderful. So now we're just going to watch a short video um, that of Agatha and Andy um, kind of chatting about the brief and chatting a bit about the process of how, how he works and, you know, how they work together. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to watch that now. I'm Agatha and today I'm, I'm here with Andy, who is the founder of Hard Edge, which is a creative agency that helps brands to make a better world. And um, we would love to talk about Hard Edge uh, more in detail later on. But we, before we get to that, I would like to ask you about how did, your, how did you get where you are today and how did your career start? Hi, um, and hello everyone else who's joining. Um, my career started uh, probably like a lot of you guys. I used to spend more time on my headings in school than I did on the actual essay. So uh, I guess I've always had a creative flair, but um, never the most talented by any stretch. But uh, uh, I, I, did, I did year 12 um, and then um, went on to do a one year bridging course to try and get my skills a bit better and managed to get into a graphic design course and um, when I got out I, I didn't do much with it initially I just saved up to, to travel but uh, um, I then got a job uh, working in a big publishing house in Australia uh, and uh, in their creative services so that was designing ads for uh, for anything like a little strip ad to a full page feeler ad in a, in a magazine um, so it was a great experience and I, I learned a lot of things. Um, sadly, like uh, it shows my age, but when I was in university, computers only just came in sort of halfway through. So uh, um, I actually wasn't up to speed with all the, the, um, the programs and so forth. So I had to almost learn from scratch all that sort of stuff in my job. But, um, but that's how I started and then moved on to another job where uh, it was a bit, bit sort of higher position, but um, wasn't a very good company to work for and um, and uh, didn't enjoy that. And then moved on to um, kind of like a uh, trade union and headed up their internal um, uh, design center and 
that was a great experience. Um, but I've always wanted to go out and do my own thing. So uh, um, I managed to convince my boss to give me the magazine that we did internal there, um, give me the magazine so that it could give me enough money to go out my own. And, uh, and so that's when I moved from the office to my, uh, my living room. <laughs> And how did you become interested specifically in design for change? Uh, for, for change, you mean? So like the focus of the agency now? Yeah, so behaviour change, when we, when we first sort of started redefining the agency, so like, like a lot of small agencies, you try to do anything for anyone and do everything um, because you're usually scrambling to get work and all that sort of thing. And, um, we were really trying to hone in on our proposition. So to be effective, like in business and so forth, you actually have to really stand for something. You have to, people have to understand very quickly what type of work you do and so forth. And we hadn't, um, we didn't really have that at all. Um, we just had the same clients that we'd worked with and just tried to get as much work as we could and, and, and that kind of thing. So it was actually through founding React when uh, back in 2016, when we um, started React, um, we became very passionate very quickly about it and realized that behavior change was something we really wanted to focus on. So um, at that time, people were, like agencies were doing behavior change, but it wasn't really like everybody's saying it now. It wasn't quite, wasn't well, sort of at the, at the, sort of the front of the wave, if you like, but, you know, very quickly everyone jumped on board with behaviour change. But, um, yeah, so it's taken us uh, f five years, but we're actually approached now by, by people to do that type of work and, you know, it takes, obviously we had a lot of learning to do ourselves, but, yeah, it's good. What was the hardest thing that you had to learn as a designer or what would you advise, what advice would you give to a new graduate? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think it's different in every case, but I, I think knowing, knowing sort of where your passions lie and what you're good at and what you, you know, believing in yourself, like I, I would say that I was never the most creative person as, as far as what I could design or draw or whatever that might be. But, you know, the ideas I had, I think was where my strength was. Uh, executing was another thing so I think I think um, just understanding what what your strengths are but what you love to do and then you know how that might fit in you know in an agency environment for example like well, what role would best suit me you know like for me it would be probably would have been more of a creative director role than a designer because I don't think I was the best designer in the world but as I said you know I had had ideas so it's um, I think it's about understanding yourself and what makes you happy and what you're good at and, um, and just believing in that. So, yeah. And obviously we are trying to put together a portfolio now and things like that. And just wanted to ask your opinion, what makes a portfolio stand out or if someone, if there's anything specific that you are looking for when people are applying to hard edge or what advice would you give? This one's easy to answer. Oh, because <laughs> um, what? So first of all, like the type of person they are counts for a lot more than than uh, you know something necessarily in the portfolio. So when what I mean by that is uh, how they might fit into the environment. You know who they are as a person. Um, do they do they have a thirst for learning? Do they want to work as part of a team and make things happen and stuff like that that really is massive because no business wants somebody coming into a, a, a into their culture and and sort of messing around with that so they you know from my point of view like you know we want we want really good people you know just good people that are looking to have the same kind of vision as what everyone else in the agency is looking for second to that as far as the work in the folio the thing I respect the most is, is when it's explained in a way that shows that they understand the work they've done. So it's not necessarily how beautiful something might look. It's actually like this is the process that I went through. You know, this is what it was developed for and what I was trying to achieve. And 
to have that understanding actually, um, you know, will most likely lead to a more effective result than, than somebody that designs for design's sake. Um, so yeah, just, just understanding what they're trying to achieve and how they go about it. Obviously, of course, you know, you want to see talent and I don't mean, I'm not trying to discount people's talent, but yeah, um, in a business, you know, it's it's not where you, like when you get, go to university and you might get a brief from the lecturer and stuff and, you know, in, in an agency, it's, it's real world and you have real outputs and, and all that kind of thing. So someone that can understand that and work towards that is, is really important. And lastly, we have a couple of fire questions that we ask everyone in this podcast series. So if you are up for it, I'm, sure. I'm just going to ask <laughs> so If you could work with anyone, who would it be? Wow. That's, that's a bit tough. I, uh, I think uh, Michael Bloomberg from the mm -hmm. States. So I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's a very wealthy man. And I think he was going to run for president. But he does a lot in the world for um, not just road safety, but uh, in middle-income countries and, and um, uh, Bloomberg philanthropies. And uh, yeah, just, I think, an impressive model of, you know, getting to that stage in life and giving, you know, doing things to actually make it a better world. But, yeah. Okay. And if you could describe your design style in three words, what would you say? <laughs> I haven't designed. <laughs> 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 uh, in three words, I would say that we. Um, I, I would say that we are current, um, clear, and simple. And uh, last question, to new graduates out there, would you say join an agency or start your own? Working in an agency first. Mm. Yeah. Andy, yeah. thank you so much for joining today and it has been incredible to hear your thoughts. Thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank You're you. You're welcome. Cheers. Fantastic. Um, so that was great. So we don't have any questions about that because obviously that was pre-recorded because um, Andy is in Australia, so couldn't be with us live today. But um, also just to have a little bit of a plug of what, um, some of the other events that we're doing later on um, in the show. So kind of the events are running over the next two weeks. Um, our students have been working really hard on a podcast that will be going live next Tuesday. So we'll be doing another event with some other fantastic industry people and a keynote speaker, um, Barrington Reeves, which is going to be fantastic. Um, so we're going to take a short kind of comfort break now. So feel free to just kind of um, leave yourself signed in and we'll come back at one o'clock for our keynote speaker, Jack Renwick. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you to all of our guests um, and our students um, for putting all the work in to make the first half of this event fantastic. I've really enjoyed it um, and I'm sure, I hope all of you have, and I know that our kind of staff team have been sending messages and kind of um, really positive about it. Um, we will have the recording available and make that um, kind of accessible to people. Um, and we will also be doing a Instagram takeover on some of the LCC platforms um, over the coming weeks. So there'll be snippets of these uh, conversations and things to kind of watch over again. I've also put into the chat a link to our graduate showcase, which is the LCC graduate showcase, which is now live. So obviously we've seen a snapshot of a few of our students work today, but you know, there's um, over 40 fantastic um, graduates coming out of our course this year. So go on the, that link and have a look at their work and their portfolios. And I think all their contact details and everything are on there. Um, we also um, have been making some physical outputs for our show, so um, even though we can't unfortunately physically be at LCC, we have lots of printed materials, we've been busy screen printing tote bags, we've got uh, an extensive 60-page uh, publication and lots of other kind of fun elements to go, go along with that. So if you're interested in receiving one of those publications, um, please just go onto our Instagram and send us a direct message um, with your address and we'll be posting those out next week. Um, so that's just a little plug of some of the other elements that we've got going on. I've also put our Instagram in the chat as well, so please give us a follow and that's where 
you're going to get the most up-to-date information about what we're up to over the next couple of weeks um, and there's also a profile on each of our students on there so you can have a look in your own time at some of their work um, so we're going to have a short break now and then we'll be back um, in 10 minutes for our keynote speaker thank you so much
Hello, Jack. Hi. How's it going? All right, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I know how busy you are at the moment. <laughs> always. <laughs> yeah, always. Particularly busy this week, but no problem. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. Um, we've just been having like a little uh, little comfort break um, after going through some of our our award-winning students work which is very exciting just been sharing some of the work from two students who entered the brand opus awards and got runner up this year and uh, the winner last year mm -hmm. um, and then talking to one of our industry partners um, in Australia um, who's been working on projects with our students this year as well yeah, yeah. Um, but I can hand over you should be able to take over control you should be able to share your screen now okay um but i can hopefully everyone's back from whatever comfort well, break needing they needed um and then i can do like a little quick intro for you mm -hmm. but um let's just it. give it and could could ask um I've got a lot of slides and I guess I'll just see how the time is going um, to, uh, yeah, to skip, I might skip past projects and things like that if if the time is running long, because it'd be quite good to get to questions. So are you aiming yeah. to get to questions by quarter two? That's perfect, yeah, that's what we were aiming for, if that's good for you. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that would be ideal. I, I can just talk, I could talk for Scotland, right, <laughs> And uh, so I, I need to <laughs> put, a, put a limit on myself. Don't worry. Um, I will, I should probably put a wee stopwatch in or something like that, or a timer. So, um, that's fantastic. If you go over a little bit as well, don't worry too much. Um, yeah. I'm Emily, by the way. So I'm oh, hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, um, I think we should get started. Um, I think it will be back, so I'll hand over to Harriet to introduce you and then we'll take it from there. Okay, yeah. I will try okay. and get my screen on the go. Perfect. Well, um, again, thank you, Jack, for joining us. Um, for those that don't know who Jack is, obviously, um, she is a, a multi award winning uh, creative director who um, learned her trade at the iconic agency, The Partners. Um, before setting up her own studio in 2012, um, which uh, very imaginatively named Jack Renwick Studio, but I think everyone really enjoys it when Jack turns out to be a girl. Hurrah! <laughs> um, but you know, I've always admired Jack's work because there's there's like a real smile in the mind approach to everything, strong um, ideas and concepts throughout, and a real sense of integrity. So I'm really pleased to welcome you, Jack, um, to our little um, gathering today. Um, thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. Um, and I've always admired your work too. I think I remember trying to kidnap you at one point in time to come and join. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm Jack, and I'm just going to work out how to use these buttons. There we go. Uh, so who I am, I am a fellow, despite being a woman, and I'm a fellow of the International Society of Typographic Designers, and that's a very proud honour. There are now 12 women in the world who have that honour, and I'm dead chuffed to be one of them. I'm a board member of ISCD now, and also DNAD, uh, so I'm the design trustee on, uh, for DNAD. Um, I've been an external examiner before at different universities, deciding who gets a first and who doesn't. Uh, uh, I advise on lots of different things. I write, I hate writing, but I have to force myself to do it. Um, and, you know, give comments and articles. I'm usually asked to, to write because I can't help but be really honest with things because I'm not very, I've got a terrible memory and I could never remember if I've lied about anything. So I just have to speak the truth. So I end up getting asked to uh, write lots of stuff. Um, I judge on lots of awards, which is absolutely amazing and a total privilege to get to see work from all over the world and um, read and understand what people's thinking behind it all. Um, I do lots of speaking around the place to students and to uh, industry. I really love speaking to students because um, a big passion of mine is to really try and encourage 
the next generation and talent into our industry, especially girls. Sorry, guys. Um, and um, my roles in my day to day work is a creative director, a managing director, a financial director, a new business director and everything else in between. Um, so I, I run a small team in London and we uh, all take on lots of roles each, wear lots of different hats. I'm from Glasgow and um, when I first moved down to London, people sort of were frightened of me and they imagined that I lived on this uh, house on the left, um, but I actually lived on the house on the right. And I don't know what they were more worried about. And um, this was my house here on the third floor of this high rise flat. And it was absolutely brilliant living, living there and growing up in Glasgow. I had tons of pals in the flats. And it was, um, I think people kind of frown on that kind of, you know, high rise council flat vibes, but um, I loved it. Uh, this was me when I was wee. This was me and my two pals. This was um, Jemima and Ted. And we used to hang out together. And at that point in time, I was probably quite sweet and but kind of quite innocent. Um, but coming through Glasgow, I uh, learned, learned about Buckfast and uh, caramel wafers, you know. So that was my diet for the next sort of 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sort of, I, I grew up to then learn how to handle myself, you know, on the main streets and, uh, you know, how to, <laughs> how, to, how to deal with uh, any, I don't know, any um, other Glaswegian people who maybe didn't like what religion I was or what team I supported. Excuse me a second, my husband's phone is ringing in the background. There we go. I am, I'm having to tether off of his uh, Wi-Fi right now. Uh, when I was wee and I was at school and my art teacher said to me, Jack, you can't draw, but you should maybe think about doing graphic design. And I was like, what's that? And they were like, we don't know, but but you shouldn't, you can't, you can't be an artist. So uh, have a look at this. So what they were saying was graphic design was about coming up with ideas rather than being the person who could, um, you know, draw beautiful things. So I decided I really liked this idea, graphic design. I thought it was two of the sort of coolest words on earth. It was like graphic sounds amazing, design sounds cool. Imagine walking about the streets and telling folk that you were a designer. Like that would be just the coolest. And um, so that's what I decided I wanted to do. So I went down to um, the careers office and the careers office back then uh, was, you know, somebody with a big phone directory, which was like a, a book, a Google book, you know, before Google existed. And they would go through it, like the yellow pages it was called. And I said, I want to be a graphic designer. And they were like, ah, what's that? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> My teachers just said that I should be a graphic designer. So they were like going through the phone book, da da da, got a graphic design, found two companies, phoned one of them up, and they were called Call Quick, and they were a 24 hour um, printing company. And, um, you know, it does like high street printing and stuff like that. And they said, I've got a young lassie here, and um, she's on the phone. Uh, she, she wants to do graphic design. Can she get a job? And they're, they're like, mm. and they're like, have you got a portfolio? And I'm like, no. And they're like, no, she hasn't. And they're like, um, well, all right, okay, thanks, bye. And then they're like, no, you kind of get a job. You have to got a portfolio. Um, and I was like, all right, okay. How do I get a portfolio? She was like, I don't know what a portfolio is. Um, so then she phoned the next one in the, in the book and that was an adult learning training centre that, and, um, that said it did graphic design. So they phoned them up. Hi, hey, I've got a wee lassie here. She wants to do graphic design. You'll take it. All right, hi. She's not got a portfolio. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, bye. Um, so that was it. They then said, you've got a job as a graphic designer. <laughs> and I was like, woo, this is amazing. So I turned up at this uh, place and um, they, they, I went in and they said, uh, uh, what size of shoe are you? And I was like, like a free. And they were like, all right. Uh, and then they, they had a sort of size up and down and come back, handed me a pair of steel toe cap boots um, a big um, set of overalls and a welding mask and I was like uh, wow you know like, I didn't know with graphic design that you got a uniform and like cool things to wear so but it turned out that this um, graphic design place was a, a training centre for people who had failed at school and what you learned how to do was to weld ramps um, for disabled um, council houses and um, you learned how to stuff couches for um, homeless shelters and you learned how to sew pockets onto aprons. And if you were able to sew pockets on at a really fast speed, you could then get a job in the local uh, factory 
uh, sewing factory. But I was too much of a perfectionist and I'd take ages with the pockets. So that just wasn't going to be my career. So while I was there, um, I met this, this guy that said, oh, you could do like a, a, an internship over across the street at this bigger printers and they, they might be able to teach you what graphic design was. And I was like, okay. So they had this hot metal press room and all the rest of it. And I would go in and kind of play about with it. And that was like my first experience of like typography. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just like mess about with it and print on wee machines and things like this. But um, in my first week, they had an Alsatian dog and I was eating a toffee crisp. And um, I didn't know Alsatians like love toffee crisps. So this dog like jumped at me and bit me in the face. And then I got fired, basically, because I had to go to the hospital, take time out. And uh, before I got to sue them or end like this, you know, um, I got fired. So then I started working in Glasgow and um, some shoe shops and things like that. And this was like kind of my career, probably over about seven years. I started, to, started selling trainers in a sports shop and then I moved on to like a fashion shop and I was selling like Timberland boots and stuff like that and then I moved on to like high fashion and I was selling like Spice Girl boots and things like that and that was like my job for years and um and you know it was you know interesting I learned a lot of how to deal with uh, demands client demands and <laughs> you know people who wanted something that you know we really shouldn't have you know so it's like how do you negotiate you know telling somebody with legs that don't suit space girl boots not to get space girl boots so all, all of all that stuff I, I feel has kind of like been good learning for my career in design um, then one day this guy said um oh i heard you know a wee bit about typography do you want to be a sign writer and i was like aye sure what do i do and he was like i just turn up monday so i turned up on monday and i thought this was what my career was going to be you know i'd I'd like have a moustache maybe and you know be like painting like these beautiful signs and all the rest of it but anyway this is what I was making so I spent about three years making signs like this and basically what that is is you would put a bit of electroset on this thing and you put it in a, an acid bath and, uh, and then it would make that thing you'd fill it with black paint and that was it I was a sign writer <laughs> and I was like <laughs> brilliant wasn't quite what I expected I did that for a few years while I'm working in the shoe shop as well in the shoe shop, I met this guy called Ed that was at Duncan Jordanson um, School of Art. And I was absolutely blown away because he was doing graphic design. And I was like, oh my God, like a real life graphic design person, somebody who knows graphic design. And I was like, my teacher said I should do graphic design. And I was like, what is it? And he was like, oh, you know, you come up with ideas for things. And it's like, you know, sort of problems for companies and brands and clients and stuff like this and I was just like pff, mind blown so I just totally fell in love with him instantly and I was like oh he's a graphic designer like it's amazing and um so I asked Ed if he would help me become a graphic designer and he said right you need to put a portfolio together he explained that a portfolio was like a big black suitcase that had pictures in it that showed people like what your design work was and I was like okay how did I get there so he, he took me he went with me up to Glasgow College of Building and Printing and when I had been uh, working at this adult learning centre years earlier, I had went to Glasgow College of Building and Printing, supposed to learn how to work a litho printer, but the teacher was off that day and I had to go and sit in the graphic design class. And I was there like for an hour and I got asked to just design a wee logo. So I was just like kind of footing about, I remember there was this thing with a leaf and then the the lecturer coming over and saying, oh, that's a, that's a good wee logo, you know, you should think about doing this. And I was like, oh, I've like made my life, you know? And um, so this was like seven years later and I went up and I was like chapped on the guy's door. And um, and I was like, Jerry Rafferty, I was like, I don't know if you remember me. I was like, but seven years ago, I drew a logo here and you said that I should do graphic design. So I'm here to do graphic design now. And he was like, oh, right, right. <laughs> well, that's not how it works. You need to apply and all the rest of it. You need to fill out forms and, you know, put things together and all that kind of stuff. And, and, I, and he was like, and you've just missed this year's intake you know that was like finished two weeks ago we've got all the students and all the rest of it and I was like oh, look man you tell me to come here you said that I could be a graphic designer I'm here I'm not leaving and I was like that oh, because I've worked I was like oh, I've worked in the most shittest jobs that you could imagine I'm shattered I want to be a graphic designer I'm here and he was just like no because you need to come back next year and all the rest of it so I just basically stood there all day and I just sat outside his door and every time I came out and I was just getting madder and madder and I was like you know look just give me a chance and I don't know why but he just went right turn up at this class when it starts like it started in like six weeks time or something like that. and he was like turn up at the class 
if you're good, I'll let you stay in the class. And if you're shit, I'll chuck you out. You've got a week. And I was like, right. So I turned up at the class. Anyway, turned out, of course, I was like miles better than everybody else. Who knew? And, <laughs> and um, he was like, all right, you can stay. So then I actually had, did have to fill out the proper forms. You wouldn't get away with that these days, obviously. Um, and then I won uh, this Glasgow Award for uh, graphic design and that then sealed, sealed the deal that I was allowed to actually stay and do this HND at um, the building printing. And that was me there, um, kind of flying the flag for graphic design and I was like all well chuffed for myself. But what I had wanted to do was go to Duncan Jordanson Art School because that's where Ed had gone to and I was like, right, I'm going there as well. I'm all surprised if you meet me in person, how small I am. I always think I'm really tall and you know, all bullshit and everything like that, but I'm, I'm quite weak. Uh, then, so I made, I, made, I made it to Dundee Art School, you know, finished the, the building print, and got my HND, managed to get into Dunkley Jordanson, um, worked my arse off when I was there, like really like took it deadly serious and really like gave, gave it my everything. Um, and I won a DNAD pencil for designing this calendar. And, um, I mean, I was always dead. Uh, Kind of, sort of proud in a way that um, the, the, the report here says he really understood the brief and he did that and he did the next thing. So when I turned up to get my pencil at the awards and I got on the stage, they wouldn't give me the pencil. And they were like, oh, sorry, dear. Uh, you know, no, it's it's uh, my boy that's one and he's called Jack. And I'm going, no, I'm, I'm Jack. And then they were like, no, 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 no. There's no way out. this could be a woman. <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually after a lot of embarrassment on the stage and for who huh, he, he gave me the pencil. So. That then uh, made me quite an attractive uh, student and I got hired by the partners, which at the time uh, it was like an awesome agency and I was all totally couldn't believe it. Um, one thing I did there, it was my favourite thing, was I painted this outside the door of the client. The partners had asked if I would rebrand them and do a new logo and do a new sort of proposition for them and all the rest of it because they thought I was a wee bit more ballsy than some of the other folk that went there who were quite polite. And instead, I was like, the logo, nothing wrong with the logo, nothing wrong with um, the communications. What's wrong is your confidence and your attitude. So I painted this outside the door on the floor, and this was the client who hated ideas. And what this said to clients coming in the door was that if you're not up for being pushed and you're not up for um, getting challenging ideas, then don't come here, basically. That was kind of it. So it was like finding a different way to express something about them without actually needing to change the identity. I also did this, which was a, a competition to design the front cover of the Metro newspaper and to design something that would cheer people up on a Monday morning. And I thought, well, what would cheer me up is if I got on the tube and there wasn't like 7,000 newspapers lying everywhere and all over the floor and totally wasteful, terrible for the environment. So I was like, how can I get people to take the newspaper off the tube and recycle it or pass it on to someone else. So I designed a uh, cover and inside back and front covers, just printed with these bunches of flowers and then you could wrap them up and you could pass them on to somebody else as if you were giving them a bunch of flowers. So it was uh, recycling and all that kind of stuff. And that won the competition and it got printed all over the UK. And my mum, for the first time, seen something that I had done and was like, you, that's all, you, Janice said to me, you were in the paper because <laughs> I had a photo on the inside as well. And, uh, and I was like, I, I, I did this cover of the paper. And she was like, what, what did you do? And she was like, did you, did you print the paper? And I'm like, no, no. Uh, I was like, no, I sort of come up with an idea. And she was like, did you grow the flowers? And I'm like, no, no. She was like, did you, did you take the photo? Like you photograph the flowers? And I'm like, no, no. I, and she was just like, what is it that you do? And I'm like, no, I, I come up with the idea to put flowers on it. And she was just sort of like, what are you even getting paid for? You know, like, it's, like, it's like absolute nonsense. But um, she sort of gets it now and she's actually quite good at it herself. So I always involve her, her and Janice in brainstorms for things, you know, because they, they, they give a really quite unique perspective. I always recommend asking people who don't do graphic design if your ideas are any good uh, and they'll soon tell you straight. Um, then I had a kidney transplant um, after I'd been at the partners for 12 years. And I was off for about six months and when I came back, I was all kind of like fired up and I was totally um, raring to go and do something new. So I, I left and then I set up my own agency. And 
I called it Jack Rennie Studio because I thought I need, put, I need to get a portfolio together and if I put a portfolio together and a website and if I called it Jack Rennie Studio, it's still my work and then they can't, the partner can't moan about it because it's like under my name. And basically I had to also think about a name like on the spot because when I resigned, my boss said, I said, that I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And he was like, ah, what are you going to do? And I was like, ah, uh, I'm going to set up my own studio. And he was like, oh, are you? What's it called? And I was like, yeah, Jack Rennie Studio. And like, uh, I had no, no intention of setting up a studio and I just kind of like then sort of had to do it because I had said it and it was ten, nearly 10 years later. Anyway, this is some of the stuff that we get up to, if you can see it. That's a wee, a wee bit of some of the stuff that we do. Um, we have stripes on everything. I wear a lot of stripes. Um, it's become like this thing that I now can't ever wear anything else in my life. And uh, but it's been quite a handy uh, icon. And that, that came about, and everybody always asks, what's with stripes? And I always say, oh, it's because I've earned my stripes. Like, you've, you've no idea how hard I've worked. And, um, but the fact was, um, we had the fancy dress party at the partners. Somebody came, there was a Jack Queen King theme and somebody came dressed up as Jack and that was, they were dressed as me. They had a, a shapey top on and red lipstick and, you know, jeans and Doc Martin boots, which, you know, I didn't realise that I actually just wore all the time and then realised how boring I was. And then when I was leaving, my old boss, Greg, said to me that um, if, you, it's like, if you don't use those stripes as your branding, then you'd be missing a trick. So... I thought, right, that's it, I'll just use it. And that's been quite handy to sort of just have a simple graphic element uh, to to use across um, all of our branding to to make us, to help us stand out, you know, and it be memorable. So it's always that sort of thing, you know, you'd be doing, probably doing your own branding and putting your own portfolios together. And it's trying to find that, what's that thing that, you know, people would talk, would say about you when you're not in the room? You know, how, how do people, you know, do they think you look a certain way or you sound a certain way or, you you know, you approach things in a certain way or you're from a certain place? It's like, what is it that you can play on that um, helps create your own personal identity um, to, to bring to, you know, to your portfolio and your work, your website? Our motto is Blood, Sweat and Tea, which um, was a, a, that's the sign we have up in our kitchen. It obviously says tears, but the, that's broke. And um, and that's really about um, working hard, you know, giving a, giving everything our all, and but also making sure that we enjoy ourselves um, at the end of it all and celebrate the the wins and, and the losses as well. You know, you've got to, you've got to take both on the chin. Uh, this is our studio, this workshop here, and it's where the first Jack the Ripper murder was, and. Um, I was quite obsessed with Jack the Ripper when I was younger, weirdly. It's not why I took the studio, I took it because it was cheap, but um, this was me dressed as Jack the Ripper many, many years ago. And so when the studio came up, I thought, right, I've got to take it. This is it on the inside, and a bit of stripes everywhere. And but how, how we work in the studio, we're all about uh, work on the walls and putting all of our ideas like on paper first. So most things are always, um, like drawn by hand to begin with, all the thinking is usually like worked out on paper before people go onto the Mac. So I think uh, we always find that it's then easy to, it's easy to start slipping into things that have been done already when you jump onto the Mac at first. And it's it's easy if you're just kind of sitting thinking about the problem, who you're trying to talk to, what are the what are the elements that you have to play with um, and staying away from your Mac, we always find that it like leads to something a bit more unique. Um, 
we don't have the walls during lockdown so this is we now do catch-ups by um you know teams meeting or zooms meeting and everybody just contributes and and the way our team works there's six of us at the minute and everybody really gets involved in everything so everybody's got an opportunity to come up with ideas and then also to give feedback the great thing about having things on the walls is people can go by and stick a post-it note or whatever stick a wee comment to help people and um and that's what sharing is all about it's like not about um like putting anybody's work down it's about you know being honest with folk and and saying how they could build on it or if something just doesn't make any sense or resonate uh, this is our international studios around the world uh, you've probably seen them at some point in time you know just give us a chat pop in cup of tea uh, this is our team and uh, we like to get up to lots of different stuff you know um, like going to awards if we've won awards which is always nice but um, I think really you know when you're trying to find the, the place to go that's for you and how you know that it's the right place for you it might not be the biggest place or the most famous place or anything like that but it's a team that you feel like they've got your back and they're sort of with you, they're there to help you, you're not there in competition with them, you know, and, and that leads to a really sort of nice culture. So you want to kind of hang out together and you want to do daft things together as well, you know, and that, that sort of extracurricular stuff helps people get to know you better and helps to, you know, sort of some people who join are quite shy, it helps get them out of their skin a little bit more as well. Uh, this is a more lockdown version of that, you know, like you've got, you've got to sort of carve out time together and, and find the time to do things, um, which can, you know, a lot of agencies are finding, you know, it can be easy to miss that in lockdown and not actually uh, make the time to do it. So it's kind of like forced fun, but uh, you've got to sort of do it. People don't actually look like this. This is a fancy dress thing, by the way. Um, this is the one day we've been together. Uh, since lockdown started in March because I went into uh, shielding and we went canoeing and we went to this thing about throwing axes and when you've been locked up for a year I totally recommend throwing axes at bits of wood <laughs> it's really brilliant thing to do because um, we've all well, me particularly I've got like super fat during lockdown and um, so we started doing PE with Joe which we then called PE with Jack so uh, this is what we do on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday morning. Uh, we take an hour out and we all do a PE class together. And so we become, you know, strong, strong body, strong minds and all of that kind of stuff. And it helps, you know, just get, get people active and, and thinking and uh, ready for the day. Something that we do at the studio um, is that we have different ministers uh, and this is a kind of work in progress of some wee logos we're designing. We have a health minister, a social minister, a culture minister and an education minister. And that gives every, each person a different role of looking after, making sure people are doing healthy stuff and sharing healthy things that we should be doing. Um, sharing social things that we should be doing. So somebody's responsible then for, you know, booking tickets for online events or anything that we can go to. Someone else is then responsible for good training courses that they find or any like online uh, sessions or lectures and things like that, or, you, you know, um, you know, sort of workshopping or anything like that that we should do. So it's quite good, you know, to assign those roles to people as their job. And then it makes sure that those things start getting covered off. So even when you're working in a, you know, like a working group at university and you're working with some of your friends, it's good to try and assign some roles so that it makes sure that you're, you're sort of covering the, the work basis, but also the health and well-being basis and the fun part as well. And it's quite good. Everybody takes a takes a shot at doing that, make sure that it happens. Um, so what I do, what our agency does, and th this is a really old um, an old school way of talking about branding. and. So when I try and explain to folk about branding, um, I, sh I show them these two slides. And this is a painted sign on the roadside that says fresh eggs. You're driving along a country lane, you see a wee sign, fresh eggs, it's all painted by hand, it's in the ground, you know, it looks shonky and handmade. But the vibe that you get off of that is that those eggs are go probably going to be quite fresh. They're going to be very local, probably around the corner. Uh, from like a farm or a, or a little um, you know house or something like that that's the sort of impression that that kind of 
hand painted little thing gives you. But if you go on another bit down the lane and you see a sign that says flying lessons sort of treated in the same way, you've got to think to yourself, is, would I get on that plane? Would I be alive <laughs> at the end of that lesson? Uh, do I trust that? Is that going to have all the safety measures in place? Um, is that the right vibe that a professional flying lesson place um, should be given across? It might look cheap and you might think, oh, it's, it's going to be a wee guy we're playing, but our job as branding designers is to create the right impression through our use of um, visual and verbal um, tools. So, you know, airlines don't look like this for a reason. You know, they have to look trusted. They have to look grown up. They have to look um, like this mature, um, safe uh, thing that you will get on their, their flight. So that's um, always when you're working on a project and you're looking at it and you're kind of like, what real impression is that given? You know, am I giving off an impression that just looks cool to my pals, but actually the, pro the product and the audience of that product is something entirely different. So you're always trying to see it through the shoes and the eyes of the end user and what they're going to actually think when you see it. Um, so some tips for some projects. Keep it simple, which is the hardest thing to do. Um, so a, a way that I do that sometimes and I teach the team is always trying to boil things down to the simplest things that you can. This project was we had to design a flag for Bankside and there's a load of agencies doing this. Um, and Bankside is, a, is on the other side of the River Thames from London, so on the south side of the river. It, years and years ago had a really notorious reputation. It was where like, you know, pirates and uh, there was like, there was no policing because it was outside the city and everybody just to just run riot and, you know, got away with, literally got away with murder. And, um, but it was also where Shakespeare's Globe was. That's one of the icons of Bankside, that area. So we were kind of thinking, right, what makes you think of Bankside then? What makes you think of Bankside now? What makes you think of flags? So we took this Jolly Roger, took the, the skull from uh, Hamlet and then combined those two things together to make our kind of Hamlet, <laughs> Hamlet, a new kind of Shakespeare flag with a bit of uh, Jolly Roger attitude. Another simple thing um, we did recently was we wanted to celebrate um, Kamala Harris uh, becoming the first uh, female vice president and again you're looking at well what is it about Kamala Harris, what is it that she's representing really and it was like she, for us, we, we, when we talked about it, it was like she's representing progress. You know, that was like a, a future thing. And, and what tools, what visual vernacular have we got to play with? And it's like, well, it's about America. So what's the most obvious thing? And that was like the American flag. You know, there's, lo there's lots of different ways you could go with this sort of thing, but we just sort of created this um, staircase and platform. And we just said, lift women, lift everyone. So it's like, you know, um, by Kamala coming in, that's given a platform for other women to also progress. So it's like looking for those sort of simple um, little twists, which are really, they look easy when they're done. You think, oh, duh, but they're, really, they're hard to get to. The way that you get there is really drilling down what is it you're trying to say. And we weren't trying to say um, there, there is a woman president or there is a, 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 a black female president or anything to do with the presidency. We're like, what does it actually mean having the first female black president? And we're like, it means progress. So that's the, that's the story we wanted to tell. Um, getting under the skin of projects. Um, and, and this is really about kind of working hard on something that, that you get and, and go, going a bit of the extra mile. So that we were, had to sell this property, it was like a property development project and they came to us, we didn't really know anything about property selling at this point in time. And they said, we need to sell flats here um, that are going to be like 900 grand for like a one bedroom flat. And there's an area in London called Fish Island, which is just across from the Olympic Park. And when we seen this, we were like, you know, holy shit, like, how are we going to sell that for like 900 grand? Like what a dump. And, um, and the whole area was terrifying. Um, but we managed to get this uh, visual off of the architects. And they said, right, this is what the developments are going to look like. And we're like, ah, right, okay, we get the gist of it all now. We can understand what's, what's coming. 
and this this was like going to be like a kind of wood wooden clad building and um, have this big structure at the front of it which was familiar to all the big kind of cranes and frames that used to lift stuff off of the cargo uh, off of the river so um, I know I know it's kind of Covid times and you can't really get out of the house but always when you're trying to work on a project see if you can go to the place or or some area or it might be a shop it might be a shoe shop it might be um, a farm it might be whatever it is that you're um, trying to sell and communicate if you can go to the place that's where you, you get much more of a feel for it and so if we hadn't gone there we wouldn't have realized quite how terrifying um, Fish Island was and um, we're walking about it was totally drug heaven you know and just basically like kind of folk lying about the streets and everybody lives in these mental warehouses and you know it's all it's all a bit mad and I thought I was mad coming from Glasgow and then I was like walking about there like shitting myself you know and, um, and so the client had said to us the part of this area there's loads of kind of like artists and graffiti artists and all this kind of hang about and every building is a canvas and um, so the client had asked us oh I should be a bit more of the kind of folk and the, the sort of vibes of the place you know um, when the client came to us, they were like, oh, we want this really creative project, Jack, and so that's why we've came to you guys. Um, we want it to be graffiti, graffiti on all of the communications, and there's graffiti everywhere, and there's a real opportunity for us to go wild with our, um, you know, brochures and website and all that kind of jazz, and we want it really arty and edgy. But when we were walking about there, there was like, it was getting dark, and I'm like, oh, fuck, and I had went myself the first time, and um, and I was getting a bit like it's all really tall old buildings dead narrow and um you know and folk coming up like you got any syringes here you know they're all Scottish of course you know and uh and I'm like oh, sorry my good man and um so we're walking about and I could see this um John Lewis sign in the distance at at Westfield at past the Olympic Park and I was like thinking if I get mugged or somebody runs to attack me I I'll run to John Lewis and I'll be saved. <laughs> so I started putting myself into the shoes of somebody who would have 900 grand to buy a flat there. And I thought maybe actually communications that are all covered in graffiti and all look a bit mental um, might not be the sort of reassurance that they need um, to want to come and live there. So um, we thought, right, what else could we do other than just cover it in graffiti, which it did sound fun. And my team were like raging, you know, oh, I do graffiti, I graffiti. Um, but we thought, actually, no, let's look at something else. So we looked at the history of the site. Turned out it done a few things in its days, um, but its main thing for the longest time had been that it had been a, a, a fine furniture maker. So this this beautiful kind of crafts um, place, and they, they brought the sideboard to London. And um, so we thought, right, okay, we, we played on two ideas. It had, been a, it had been a furniture makers and it had been a shoe factory. And then, so we did two routes. One was all about shoes and about, you know, having your feet on the ground and being in the area and, you know, walking about the area and all the amazing things that the area had. And the other was about, much more about um, the reputation of the area and the craftsmanship of the artists and the people who were all there and the craftsmanship of the building that was coming. So. This was some of the homework we had done. Come up with this idea made of character. And that was referencing the character of the actual uh, site itself and the island itself and um, the character of the building. Um, and these were all the kind of peoples, the people who, who live there, you know, joggers and bloggers and um, jewelers and bakers and all of these kind of people. So these were all the characters that you were going to be meeting. And we used this uh, wood grain uh, effect with them um, to represent this kind of the, the quality of the wood that was going to be covering the the building but also the history of the building that had been there as well um, and that then became the the, the, the kind of graphic glue that could go across all of our communications and using that uh, that wood block print um, it was quite industrial feeling as well which felt appropriate to the area you know it was a very industrial area um, and you so using those big kind of caps and um, felt in reference to all of that as well and then this was uh carpenter's wharf uh, that we named it and this was just like a wee c in the logo and a little fish to represent um, the area which is called fish island and um, just in the logo there made out of the wood 
um, some of the columns. Now, when we're working on the project and we're trying to get that kind of graphic texture together, you can buy stuff like this for like £10 on stock libraries, but it didn't really feel real to me. Uh, you know, like, um, are we trying to tell an authentic story about, about this original building? And, um, and this felt like cheating. So we went around and asked all these kind of artists and makers and craftsmen if we could have a bit of wood, um, if any of them worked with wood. Or, and then there was just all stuff lying all over the place. So everybody sort of like donated a wee bit. Then we kind of um, blowtorched it all to get the grain, that helps the grain come up a little bit. And then we cut it into blocks and we got um, some help from an art school to print these blocks. And that gave us Te real texture to play with and it's much more visually sort of beautiful and pleasing than it is than the eye stock you know um graphic version of it so if, if, for us that felt like you know kind of like really worth the effort to make things have this sort of beauty to it and real and real story to it than to 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 buy something like this so i always think you know push push beyond the easy all the time you know it's easy it's easy to do things easy but you know you'll get a better result if you really try and and, and push uh, what it is that you're that you're doing and, and finding different ways to execute it. Um, another point uh, is about uh, making things different. And we have um, our, our motto is make it different, make a difference. And um, this is a wee example of that. So this was a brief to design an A4 an A4 poster that could be sold at a charity auction. And the theme was around courage. So we, we asked the team, you know, right, okay, what could we do? An, A, an A4 poster about courage. So our first idea was um, to print it in A3 and stick it in the A4 frame. And so it says the only rule is whatever you create must be A4 sized. And so we thought, well, it's courageous not to do A4 and actually do A3 and then it just hangs out of the, the frame. And then we, um, we thought, right, if courage is about you know speaking your mind and you know standing up for things um the one in the middle we turned the frame into like a protest banner and we just draw pictures not arms and um and then the other the one on the right was just a soapbox you know to, to stand up and speak up and so these would have looked nice as posters but as um so i like just trying to kind of think well what's useful um and Giving somebody a platform is useful and giving somebody a, a ready-made protest banner to go out and, and talk about things um, is, is courageous, as it was our sort of courageous uh, take on all of these um, ideas. Um, so trying to always kind of think, yes, we could be asked to do an A4 poster, but what if we didn't? What else could we do? Uh, and then this is a project about making a difference, and it's something that we take quite uh, seriously with the clients that we choose to work with and the um, projects that we get excited about taking on. So we worked, we've worked with um, UCL University in London uh, for many years. UCL is like the eighth university in the world, so really big prestigious um, outfit, you know, and like really big wig people who, you know, and they've got, you know, imagine you're presenting to a client, you present to like 80 you know, folk with, you know, lots of brains, basically, and lots of challenging questions, and you're trying to find something that can resonate with all of these things. They, they have such a broad offer, they're not like specialists in certain subject areas, they do everything, they have an art school, they have an architecture school, they have, they're like the, the world leaders in neuroscience and all, all of this, they, they, they do every subject you could imagine, and um, we had worked with them to try and Come up with a proposition and a proposition is all about you know what do we talk what do we say about ourselves how do we in a very shorthand thing say this is who we are and what makes us a little makes us different from oxford and cambridge and other universities and ucl have this past of um being like the first university to allow women to study the first university to allow people who were not um church of england to study so they had this quite rebellious spirit of when they first set up and they kept on talking about that as as themselves and it was a very historical story but what they were doing now was equally as interesting you know they are taking huge leaps their research is incredible and they are really tackling world issues like big time 
So we had thought, right, okay, this idea of the home of brave thinkers, and it, so it could encompass brave thinkers of the past and brave thinkers of the future and people who are there today. So this was sort of the, the, the hook that sits at the heart of the brand. And to launch, uh, we had a project brief, which was there was a new campus getting built in the east end of London. Um, UCL is, is in central London. Um, so they were building this new campus out in the east. Everybody was dead excited about it. It's going to have robots and it's going to have all this tech and it's going to do all these sort of great things. So they wanted all this hoarding that was going around the campus to talk about um, the new campus that was coming. But what, what that sort of felt like to us was it was only really kind of celebrating those um, sort of technology-based subjects that were there and it wasn't giving people it felt quite unfair to the folk who were then going to study at the other university as if everything they were doing was boring you know and they're, they're, they're like doing pure epic stuff over there and um, and then it was like all about UCL East, UCL East is the best and um, so we went back to them and said look we don't think we should be celebrating UCL East at all we think we should be celebrating UCL and we should be putting this idea of brave thinking at the heart of everything we're not talking about how many um, new studios you're going to have and how many students you're going to be able to fit in because the, the, the point of a hoarding isn't to get people to apply to university maybe some people who happen to walk past it might but it's to make local residents aware of what's coming and not feel pissed off <laughs> at what's coming you know see that this building is going to actually be something of benefit to them as well and something that they could feel proud of so we come up with lots of different ideas and I just wanted to show you some of these because you don't always get your own way. Sometimes you come up with stuff that you think is genius and it's not. And then you take a step back and you're like, oh, of course it's not. And, um, and you just take it on the chin. So this was uh, route one for this idea. And we were trying to go, right, this is the home of brave thinkers. What can we do? And so we'd come up with this idea about we'll accept any challenges. We're a university and we take on any challenge that the world has. So we had this, you know, achieve a world without dementia, challenge accepted. Um, make robotics affordable, challenge accepted. Create cities that are good for our health, challenge accepted. And all this, showed them that blank. Um, you know, they were like, that could be for any university. That could be, and I was like, yeah, yeah, but nobody's doing as many things as you guys are. Yeah, yeah. well, but you know, could could be anyone. And it was like, well, oh, yeah. we showed them this a different way of looking at challenge accepted. Same thing, because we really kind of like this hook about these challenges, these big world challenges. Can we achieve a, a carbon free world? Challenge accepted. Can we, you know, preserve arts and culture? Made their logo a bit bigger. You know, it's like, oh, if you don't know, right, if it's not associated to UCL, then we'll make the logo a bit bigger. So we'd come up with this sort of look that did all these intriguing things, and, and then it would tell you a bit more about it in these wee boxes. Presented that, <sighs> lead balloon. I hated it. Um, <laughs> like, what, what is it that you hate? You, you know, so see so when a client's telling you that they hate something, you've really got to push them to understand why. Uh, because if they, otherwise you're away guessing, and it was like, maybe they hated pink. Or maybe they just don't like robots, or they think robots is inhuman and it should be human. But you, you know, you're just guessing and you don't know then how to improve anything. So we really had to push it, and clients find it quite uncomfortable as well to have to explain why. They're like, don't know why, it just doesn't feel right. It's just not right. Um, so um, they, they were quite tricky on that front and not really been able to explain why. They just were like, it's not, it doesn't feel like us. So we went, we went back and we had looked at, right, well, what does UCL look like just now? And what, what's the sort of key elements of UCL? And what, one of the things that holds their whole identity together is this big banner that they put across the top, this kind of like big masthead that they have across the top of their um, communications. Um, so we thought, right, well, let's, let's use that a bit more um, front and centre. So we had come up with this idea about disrupt the narrative. And it's like, we'll never have a carbon neutral society, you know, UCL challenge accepted. So they said they'd like, they quite like this challenging thing. And so we were using this as this kind of stamp, you know, here comes UCL to disrupt it and, you know, say, you know, it will happen, you know, that like the science class lab is no place for women. And we're like, you know, almost UCL comes and we score that out and things like this. So we're thinking, all right, this, this, this is more sort of UCL, hated it. 
um, <laughs> then we did this. Um, Hello Challenge. We thought maybe we'll be more gentle about it. Hello Challenge, meet UCL. Um, so we're, we then used their banner in a more kind of direct way. And it was like, hello injustice, you know, we're going to sort it out. Hello uh, equality, here comes UCL, we're going to make everybody equal. Hello pollution, we're going to sort it out, you know. Um, and we were thinking, you know, this was like a really quite nice thing, you know, um, like hello cancer, here comes UCL type thing. And um, But then they were like, oh no, it's like as if we're inviting and that we like pollution. <laughs> and it was like, oh no, <laughs> we're totally, this just, just isn't working. By this point in time, we're about to get fired. Uh, you know, and this is just sort of like what you'll deal with a lot is just like you come up with things, you've worked your ass off, you know, you've done it all night and you're like, right, here we go, guys. And it's just like, no. So this was actually Route 5. And um, so we're like, what is it that we're trying to say? We're like, UCL makes makes this difference. They, their thinking makes the difference to this, these terrible things. So we thought, right, OK, well, if there's bad things going on, can UCL make things good? So we started using this kind of like stripe banner effect. And it's, everybody thought oh, I was just doing it because I had stripes. Um, excuse me. Um, but it wasn't, it was because the UCL thing, the stripe. And, um, and this was cutting in and becoming the thing that made the change. And um, so we used that as this sort of vehicle so that you see the UCL banner itself was playing this kind of active role in coming along and finding a problem and bringing the change, bringing that positive uh, change to it. And, um, and then we showed them this and we, we showed them this across quite a few uh, different ideas about the things that they were doing and how it was a way that it could encompass all the different things that was going on at UCL and not leave anyone out. So that was like, you know, from sort of bringing an end to blindness, to green cities, to Alzheimer's, art and culture, all of these sort of different subject matters. And they eventually they liked it, they loved it. So it was like, at last. And um, the best thing of it was when it went up on the Olympic Park, it had an even sort of better effect than what we had imagined. We had thought, oh, people coming to the area, who lived in the area would think, well, that's cool that there's a building coming that's going to be doing these cool things, this, this UCL university, that's great. And I'm, I'm chuffed, to, that's in our community. But what we then found was that schools, local schools were coming and bringing kids around and telling them like the stories and using it as like this kind of big outdoor sort of teaching space uh, sort of um, during lockdown. And uh, that, that, that was brilliant. So that's, that was like the highlight of my, my life, I think. Um, I'm going to probably stop there. I've got loads of stuff that I could show you and talk about uh, and I could really sort of bore you to death with it. But um, I think maybe having some questions might be good and uh, if that's cool with you guys. That sounds great. Thank you, Jack. That was amazing to see so much of your, your work and uh, also like just a little bit of a behind the scenes into how the studio works and how you approach projects um, and uh, obviously your Glaswegian upbringing a bit fuck fast, <laughs> always good. I had that at my wedding because I'm married a Scot, so, you know, it's... <laughs> away a little drink <laughs> oh it's, yeah it's very dangerous um we've got the q a button box down at the bottom for any questions uh, from our audience um but i have been being sent i've been sent a few questions already um via dms so i can get started with a few questions if that's good for you okay please ask ask away um I'll be, I'm totally honest, open about anything. The more stupid of the better. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Well, I know where to start then. Um, so what have we got here? So um, you shared at the beginning with your um, work for the partners, how, what happens to clients that don't like ideas? How have you dealt with clients that don't like ideas? in a more legal fashion than that approach? Yeah, and, and actually in a more, um, what you've got to remember, right, when you're working for an agency, what I was very guilty of was I'd be in the middle of presentations and I'd decide I didn't like the idea as I was presenting it. I think, that just sounds really boring. I'm bored presenting this. So what I'll do is I'll just tell the clients, I don't like this anymore. Um, I, you need to give us another week and we'll come up with something better. And my bosses would be sitting like that, you know, 
like sharp and I'd be like that. Why? It's too aggressive. It's a bit dull. What I didn't realise is what a week's wages and costs and all of those things that comes with that, you know, and um, they've obviously put a proposal together that it outlines your costs and the time you're going to spend and what you present is then what you present, you know. So I quickly learned that how much money that actually costs when I'd be doing it for my own studio, you know, of deciding that I didn't like things. So I would kind of shut up about it a bit more. So then when the clients then say that they didn't like it, I would realise that I've got to get paid for this job. So I can't just go, well, tough or, um, you know, throw my toys out the pram or be kind of pissed off about it. I'd, I'd be like, I need to find a way to still get the essence of what I think is the right idea. Um, but so find a way in their words and in their language to try and sell that idea in better. Because if a client doesn't like it, that there's something fundamentally wrong. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot, sometimes it's just pathetic things like, well, my wife doesn't like pink, so, um, you, you know, um, stuff like that. But, you know, when the client's usually saying that they don't like it, it's like you're, you're trying to be like, right, well, we've not, we've not nailed it. So there's, there's absolutely no point um, coming away from it and being angry or, or letting them know how angry you are about it. You can stand your ground and think and say, that's a shame. I really thought that answered um, this aspect of the brief really well. And that's where you've got to be answering the brief, you know, and, and understanding it from the client's perspective. If you can only argue, if you can only argue on a visual reason or a thing that you think looks nice, or you know, it looks really good, or whatever. It's not an argument. You know, you, the only argument you can ever have is really about that your your customers are more this way inclined, and and the visual reference that they're they're used to seeing. Because maybe some clients are a bit older, and you're trying to sell something for a younger market. So, but you then have to evidence all of that in your presentation. You have to set the scene. So when you're building up to present your idea, you're setting the scene of this is the 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 sort of um, world that these people live in this is the kind of food they eat this is the brands they buy this is the sort of stuff they wear so that when you present your idea they they're in that kind of mindset and they're a wee bit more out of their own mindset if that makes sense yeah so really helping them take them on a journey through to how you get to that idea yeah um, which um kind of leads on to one of the other questions and I might just like um build on that a little bit but um how do you push clients for that useful feedback you know when you're doing the UCL one like do you have a specific um and also how you get that initial brief so that it does hit everything and it is not just like we need a new logo you need it to be better otherwise you're not able to create work that answers it right yeah, absolutely. It's it's so um, tempting when you get a brief to just sort of run away and start thinking you're going to be just coming up with visual ideas and things like that for it. But you really have to take the brief, really kind of understand the brief. Um, and we always talk about strategy as if strategy is like some oh, big, uh, mind-blowing, clever thing. And strategy is really only understanding what what is it that these people are trying to say and who are they trying to say it to and what is the mindset and the understanding of those people that they need to hear about this product or this thing um, in order for them to engage with it. And um, so I think starting uh, any brief like that, you all you always have to start strategically about it and you have to really frame who you're talking to what are they interested to hear and really understanding what are the real benefits about this product or this service or university and um, that you can tell people about and um, it's not really a benefit it wasn't a benefit for us to tell people you know how many classrooms this thing had like you, you know that's what they thought that's what the brief was originally but when you when you start to unpick it you're like is, is this audience really interested to hear that you know, um, so I think that that sort of, like you're saying, unpicking and then building up a, a, a story before you've got any visual thoughts of really what the brief is and what they're asking. And going back to the client, we always go back to the client with about 20 questions before we've even started to 
think about, you know you're unpicking the, the problem and you're you're going like really is that is that really who the audience is because you you're starting to think about ideas in your head not visual ideas but hooks that you can start to um, answer the brief with um and then you realize well actually half of the information in the brief is missing you know who's it for why yeah. would we care i always just ask who's going to care about this and always let us in, in a really shorthand it's like does it pass the so what question you know so what you know <laughs> i'm looking at this yeah. thing, blah 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 so what you know what what do you want me to think what do you want me to feel and um and that's a good way to push back to your client and and saying to them you know like well, what what would be the so what for your for your brief because i feel like if i tell them about this thing if i tell them oh they're the bouncy issues are they looking for bouncy shoes um you know or are they looking for looking good and being comfortable at work do, do you know you know what i mean like you yeah i think what's the actual thing that people need so I mean, why would they think so what so i think um, so what is always a good thing. i think that's especially useful when you know when you're working with a, a partner or like a the owner of his startup business that's their baby that they're trying to brand or sometimes mm -hmm. brand managers also get so wrapped up in their world that they think that the smallest how many classrooms is a massive headline news and it's really for the audience that they're trying to com um, communicate with there's so many people out there saying so many messages nobody exactly who cares um <laughs> another <laughs> Another question that we had was about um, the beautiful simplicity of your, your ideas and how pure they are. So um, you seem really efficient in getting inside clients' heads and seeing things from the audience perspective. Does your keeping things simple method come from hundreds of iterations or do they come quite quickly in the moment of clarity? So that's a really good question. I would say more on the hundreds of iterations than that one single thing because you, you come up with loads of stuff and you put it down and you know you know yourself if it's just not, you know, it's kind of stuff that you're doing you're like, ah, yeah. but you know when you've sort of like made that thing and if you think this just feels a bit so what um, and then you're stepping back and it's like, what is it that's so what about it? And like on the say the Kamala Harris and the team are coming up with ideas on it. It's like, they're, they're trying to make um, like a female the thing, or they're trying to make um, a black female the thing, or they're trying to, um, you know, sort of go and like, you know, like women in the White House, you know what I mean, and tell the story that way. It's about women in the White House. And it's like, and you're like, kind of, that's great, there's women in the White House. What does that mean? So what? There's women in the White House. Great. What are they, what are they doing? What are they going to do? What they're going to do that's different in the White House, you know, it's great that they're there, but it's just kind of like not far enough, you know. So you've got to think, well, what's go what's good about women being in the White House? And you're like, ah, ah it opens doors, it 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 um it creates opportunity for 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 other women, it creates opportunity really for everyone. And so we were like, well, what is what is opportunity? What is a a, a change? And we then we start to think about opportunity as progress. So then my, my tighter brief to them was then how, what represents progress? You know, how would we show that America has moved on? You know, um, yeah. and then we've got lots of arrows and, you know, arrows instead of stars and the flag and things like that, you know, and those sort of things. Um, and then it was the wee thing that was like, that, that looks like, and it wasn't even meant to be, you know, I was like, that looks like, that looks like a staircase. And then, um, Susie visualised it and then she added that platform on it and it felt like even the staircase was good but the platform at the top was the thing that just sort of nailed it it was like otherwise it's like a road to nowhere it was like a road to a platform to, to have a voice if you know what I mean yeah so it's not simple it really isn't you have to keep working on it you have to keep drilling down and always just being like what's the key thing that I need to get across if you step away from your idea and you're looking at it and you're like, what, what is it I'm getting across? And you might have got across progress, but maybe it's not America moving forward, or you might have got across women moving forward. You're like, ah, but could that be for any country? Or could, you know, so you're always like being really hard on yourself. I beat myself up like you wouldn't believe, you know, and I'm always like, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> no one. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. 
again. Yeah, my bin, my, you know, my bin's like, you know, 99% of stuff goes in the bin. That's, yeah. just, that's just reality. Yeah. I think it's important for the students to, you know, as they come out into the world, to not be precious about their work and obviously stick to your guns to a certain extent, but don't let it get to you every time you don't hear back from someone or um, uh, an internship doesn't land a job or the client didn't like your work. You just got to pick yourself up and do it again and again. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And, you know, sometimes I've had clients in the past where it's like, I've had to then just stop the project and say, I don't think you know what it is that you want. And I'm just, I'm just scattergun and everything everywhere because I haven't really got a clue. And I said, the problem isn't with what we're doing. It's actually with your brief. Yeah. I don't think you as a, as a business have really sort of decided a direction that you want to go in. And therefore everything that we do isn't resonating because it's not reflecting something that's in your mind that you haven't told us. And, and that uh, takes guts. That, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, took, it, uh, it did. It took me knowing that we were going to lose the business to do it. But at, at that point, it was when I was at the partners and, you know, I was having to phone the team and get them to work all night again and every weekend again and again and again. And it was like, no, nah. I thought, no, nah. I just lost it in a meeting one time. <laughs> like, enough <laughs> I don't recommend that that's that's not a good move you know it's like deep breath and then thinking everybody clients want to hear they want to hear no problem no problem no problem we'll fix that but no problem just gives you a problem you know you're like then you're just going to water down your stuff or you're just going to be like what, what, what even do they want you're trying to give across the impression of we will we'll fix this together. We, we we'll we'll get on this, but let let's just kind of if you wouldn't mind analyze a bit of what it is that you don't that that isn't working for you, um, and so that you feel it feels like you're on their side. You're not kind of going. But I thought it was brilliant, and um, or being in a mood. You're kind of like going. C would you mind? Would you spend a bit of time to really kind of like work out what it is that's working? And, and like you say, like we don't know. So I have to then go. Is it because the logo's not big enough? No, no, it's just it's something. Is it? Is the language just not clear? Yeah, I think it's, and then you're unpicking it, you're like, is it confusing? Yeah, it is, it's just confusing. I feel cold. I feel, you know, and you, you just have to keep throwing things at them. Is it this, is it that, what about that? And usually you know the things to suggest because you, actually once you've presented it, you can start seeing it yourself and you're like, that is a bit boring or doesn't actually make any sense. And um, so you can start offering those doubts as questions and um, and then that helps helps them find the right words, you know, and what that means is you're going to tear your own work up, but but you have to do it in order to build build the layers back up again. You know, yeah. you might even go back to earlier thoughts, but you've approached them in a different way. You know, I think so. Uh, I think within the. Um within your process as well, like keeping away from the max, that's definitely something that we're always encouraging our students to, to do as well, rather than just jumping on it straight away um, and going to explore the spaces, really immerse yourself in that environment because you never know what, yeah. what that's going to bring out away from that, that brief um, can, uh, as a starting place. Um, do you ever with clients share like just do tissue sessions where you just share like, like really rough sketches or do you normally go in with finished pieces and how many routes would you normally go in with? Um, so it's always kind of like three is always the magic number that clients mostly want to see. I prefer to go in with one if I can, uh, but it's risky. And um, you, you've got to kind of be sure that the client will give you another chance if you haven't landed that one answer. You know, so I would, I'll usually sort of present three and I'll be really animated and passionate about one so that, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, here's route one, blah, blah, blah. Here's route two, uh, here's route three. Wow. Like, and then I'm like jumping about the room, you know, and see like your own energy and belief in things is really infectious to the client because they've hired you because you're a professional and you you know that's that's what you do and so if you're excited about it and you're like and you believe in it and you can't I can't lie about stuff like that I could never get 
passionate about something I genuinely thought was all right you know but if I think really this is something and it might not be the right visual execution but I'm like there is an idea here that really answers your problem then I let them know that and I'm like you know I find different ways to be talking about it and like, it answers this and it could do that and then I'm like thinking it could also go on and do that it could go on and do this and it could solve these other things and then then they'll say well what's your favorite route I take it it's route free and I'm like yeah 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 you know and I'm like I think it's just magic but you know there's no point going I think it looks really great because who cares about it looks really great or you know it's cool or anything you know nobody gives a shit about that it's um they, they care about framing framing why you like it in their problem and who they are trying to solve a problem for you know um but if you're just kind of like well, i really like it um they don't care yeah you know, it's like we think your we think your customers will really like it because of these reasons yeah um, so three routes and um what was the first part of your question oh just um just mentioning about the fact that like working off screen and if you did any like rough shares so, some clients I, I, I'm kind of finding more and more that clients expect really polished visuals and, and have stopped being able to see a rough idea you know they judge it they're judging it visually you know that you know and, and it really drives me up the wall because you so you it's always a good caveat at the start when you're talking through your ideas to say Guys, these are rough visuals. Try and look beyond the, you know, the, the, the Photoshop and the, um, you know, it might not be the exact words. It might not be the exact models that we've used or whatever it might be, but it's about the ideas. Let's try and focus on as um, is the, is the idea there. And how you know that if you've got a good idea, what, what um, I was always taught and I teach my team, is can I phone you and tell you about this idea with, without any pictures? And does that idea then sound interesting? Because I'm not explaining, um, oh, it's blue, or it would have big squares on it, or whatever. I'd be talking about it. I'd, you have to talk about it more fundamentally. Like, um, well, you're trying to communicate to people in the East End of London who doesn't know who UCL are or doesn't know what they do. So, and it, you know, and you want them to engage with it and, and feel that that's a good thing for their area. So if UCL is doing all these world problems, um, let's show the world's problems, but show what UCL is doing and we can use your logo to completely disrupt and, and interact like strips just running straight through the problem. And you don't need to even see, you don't need to see pictures about it. You know, you, you can talk it and it's a really good um, practice to do. With, with your idea if you could phone somebody or uh, without any pictures and tell them the idea then you know you've yeah. got something and you find yourself finding words to explain it and you know, you're kind of like no well it's a bit it's a bit more like um no 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 um m m maybe it's you could really if you think about it and, and you, you you either soon find out this is good this has got nothing <laughs> you know <laughs> that's a shit or that there, there is a, a hook there and sometimes what it can just help to do is help clarify the brief a little bit better in your mind when you talk through it so definitely top tip to to phone yeah phone isn't it great out. when you can have a team and really collaborate and even when we're all um sat at home in our, in our offices and bedrooms um like you guys are doing so well at collaborating and our students have been doing the same, both with them, mm -hmm. other students and the tutors and industry professionals that we've been contacting over the year. Um, I've noticed, I'm just, this is the last question. That's all right. Um, uh, the, la <laughs> um, the last question kind of is a, is a, a mix of a few together, but um, Obviously, Jack Renrick as a brand um, is quite distinctive with its stripes and its personality. Um, and that obviously comes from you. Um, I, I've noticed a lot over the last couple of years, and I don't know whether it's COVID uh, in particular or the, the turn of freelance, but a lot of graduates, instead of heading straight for um, univer uh, like for graduate junior jobs, they're more interested in going freelance or setting up their own um, agency. 
um, or just going it alone, how, what would you recommend um, or, you know, advice for our students who are looking to create their own um, identity as a designer? I definitely think creating your, your own identity is bloody hard. <laughs> and you're sort of like, you know, who cares? Who cares about me? What have I got to say? And, um, and so you're kind of, you know, it's like a hard look in the mirror of, um, right, what do I want to, how do I want to position myself? You know, like, what do I want people to think about? Is it, can you still see my screen at all? Uh, no. I think you can press share screen at the bottom. Uh, if I share this one second, I don't know if it will help explain it a wee bit. Uh, share, share screen, there we go. So this was something I had put together for a different talk. This was about how you set up a business. What, how not you set up a business, more, more to the point. I didn't have a clue when I set up a business, what I was doing. I just left the comfort of a full-time job in a bad mood. So um, this, is a, this is a positioning matrix and what it should have on the edges of this position matrix, this is obviously a, a work in progress, um, is what you want people to think about you when you're going out there. Are you trying to put yourself across as professional um, you know, you might be suited and booted and look um, like a grown up and look as if you're in control, you can handle things, you know, you're worth the money, um, which is business time over here. Um, or you might want to look, I'm super creative, you know, I'm mental, um, I'm totally wacky, uh, you know, I'm so me, an individual and all the rest of it, which is great. The individual part is, is really great. What you've also got to think, though, is this client's got a bag of money and they need to choose to give it to somebody. And, and who they choose to give it to is going to be based on quite a few different factors. Um, if they don't know you and if you haven't, they haven't heard of you and, and you don't have um, the reputation of having done it before and the experience and the, and the portfolio to be able to show that you've done it before, it's harder for them to have trust you know, so they might be a bit more inclined to give the money to someone who might be a little bit more boring, but they know will get a job done. It will be delivered in time. It will be delivered on budget. It might not be the most exciting idea, but um, it will. They will. They'll not get fired. You know, whereas hiring the more exciting person, there's more risk for them that they might get fired, because you know, God knows what will come back. <laughs> you know so firstly thinking about yourself how, how do you want to uh, come up, come across and there's no right way or wrong way you just got to be aware of where a client's head's going to be at the client might be coming and wanting a wild card in the mix and want somebody who's never done it before we often get brought we, we do such a broad range of projects and we often get brought in as a wild card because we don't have experience in that sector and we've never done it before but they're interested to see what we might do um so I think, you know, when you're um, any client who's looking to hire you is going to be looking for some evidence of what you've done. And you might, you're not going to have evidence in their sector all of the time. But what you'll have evidence of is this was a problem for maybe, you know, an audience similarity. So we, we had to speak to young people. So the project might be a bit for young people. Another project you've done is about young people. So you're packing, you're selling it in a understanding the audience kind of sense. Um, but I think, let me see what else is in this press that I started putting together. Oh yeah, this is about hiring good people. This is about um, costs. When you're setting up, there's a lot of costs. Um, you know, you think, I have laptop, I'm sorted. Uh, which was uh, back here. Oh, aye. Da, da, da. oh aye. this is an important thing, right? What you need is an, not spam, right? But you need an inbox that's got business coming into it. You don't need a solid metal business card with, you know, you spent like six million pounds on. Do you know what I mean? Like that's not the stuff that's going to get you jobs. <laughs> you know, I don't think it'll, it might, might be impressive when you 
get, get into the room, but um, don't be spending your money on, on that. Spend your money on getting some social media out there and getting work out there and getting opinion out there. Spend time commenting on people's work positively, saying um, work that you like and you, you know why you like it. And so you're starting building a, a network there. You're starting building um, some connection to people that are in the industry by, you know, kind of not like love that, love that just for the sake of it, but why you love it and why it connects with you is a really great way to build your network. Um, not having, you know, solid gold business cards. Um, I think um, you might have uh, a laptop and think everything is cool and that's all you need, but you have got to be aware of um, the cost of stuff and you might not need, you know, all of, all of this sort of stuff, which seems all a little bit old school right now. But before you know it, and you're trying to work out your value and you know how do you cost a job and how much did it cost and, and what do you do? You need to also think about, right, well, I, I, need a, I need to pay for my computer. I need to make sure I've got good a good system. You need to pay for your Adobe suite, make sure you've got all your licenses. You need to pay for phone lines if you're in, a, if you're in an office space, um, which might be mobile or whatever. If you're hiring any support, you've got their salary. Um, you might have rent, you might have, um, you, you know, you've got Wi-Fi to pay for. And you might think, well, it's all right, I'm, I'm doing it out in my bedroom and all, all the rest of it. But these are like the real true costs of doing business, like the, the, the reality of it. You know, if you've got a studio, you've got to pay for cleaners. You know, you've got, you know, it's bills, 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 basically is what you get. Then you've got VAT and tax and all this sort of stuff. And then you've got alarms and websites and you've got bloody you know god knows what insurance and then you've got an accountant you'll have to do bookkeeping you've got to pay for website hosting blah 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 oh. right a lot oh my goodness right there's a lot of stuff so i think it's like setting up but doing it with your eyes open and thinking that the cost of doing business isn't just the cost of you sitting in front of your mac it's the cost of keeping that Mac running with all of that stuff and making sure that you're above board and you know you've got a set of terms and conditions and you've got um you're not just kind of starting off doing favors for, you absolutely do favors for people it'll help build your folio and all the rest of it you know what I mean but but realistically when you're thinking about um what it takes to to set up on your own just kind of have your eyes open a wee bit it's not just you sitting in front of your computer that you've got to think about and thinking oh I got 500 quid for that job it took me two months uh you know <laughs> took me two <laughs> months and, uh, and you know I had to upgrade my computer halfway through and I had to do whatever you know um they're all real yeah. costs there's so much to learn um I'm <laughs> sure our students are going to be going on a very steep learning curve um over the next um months but um thank you so much that was fantastically fascinating and uh you answered those questions so so honestly and i think that everyone's really going to appreciate that um so yeah thank you so much and i think um we're gonna wrap it up there brilliant great cool pleasure to speak to you and oh if anybody's looking for internships or anything like that we're always uh, looking for new talent meeting new people and all the rest of it so uh send us a an email at hello at Jack Rent Studio or, you know, ping us on LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn or on Instagram or Twitter or something like that and send us your stuff. And um, if you're interested, then not really bored, stupid already. Um, but. Um, thanks so much for joining us. It's been really great. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Pleasure. And um, a wee last point. Loads of people are looking and, and it might it might be... Um, you know, I can imagine being a graduate this year and thinking, oh my God, like what have we graduated into? But the industry is booming and they are hungry, hungry, hungry for young talent, desperate. I get emails all the time, do you know anyone who's, who's out there? And this is like a really brilliant time to be graduating. Like everybody yes. is suddenly, clients are back again. They all want stuff. People have also got rid of maybe the more expensive people. Um, who've been <laughs> around for like a thousand years sort of thing and they're, they're really really hungry for um, young talent so re really just send your stuff if they don't get back to you so what if, they, if they're not interested so what really if you don't ask you don't get 
um, don't don't sit about waiting to be asked or anything like that because other people are just out there asking already. So what have you got to lose? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know. Amazing. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Cool. Make sure you get a copy of our graduate publication sent out. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I've got a lot of talent. It, and it looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh great. Good. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Brilliant. Good luck, everybody. Right. Get stuck. See you later. Bye. Bye. Um, and yeah, uh, as Harriet said, we're going to wrap up there for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we'll make sure people who attended um, have access to the recording and we'll have some kind of content um, out over our social media. I've just put the graduate showcase link and the link to our Instagram in the chat one more time. Um, but that's, that's all for today. And look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.